Thank you so much, uh, Gary. And I truly hope that we have a partner out there in interstellar space because uh, we all know what uh, Steven Weinberg, the Nobel laureate, uh, said at the end of his book, the first three minutes. He said that the, most, the more we understand the universe, the more pointless it looks. And of course, I understand that because Steven Weinberg and most cosmologists focus on lifeless entities, elementary particles, stars, and we know from our private life that finding a partner provides a meaning to our existence. The same holds for finding a partner in outer space. Suddenly, the universe will not appear to be lonely. And uh, what I'll discuss today um, can be summarized in one word, interstellar. There is a new frontier in astronomy. That's what brought me to this discussion. Um, when Gary mentioned the table, I was actually traumatized at the dinner table as a young kid because I would ask a difficult question and the adults in the room would dismiss it because they wouldn't know the answer and they didn't want to show any weakness. So they just removed the question off the table. That was traumatizing to me as a kid. And I haven't changed since then. I'm still a curious kid that grew up on a farm. And um, I decided to become a scientist so I can answer the question myself by collecting evidence. That's a great privilege. You don't need to rely on other people. Forget about people. Just look at nature. So over the past decade, we found the first objects from outside the solar system. And the experience is like watching objects that come from the street into your backyard. Of course, many of them might be rocks, like the ones that we are familiar with. But there might also be a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor. So for me, the interest in this was Maybe we can find a technological needle in this haystack of rocks that are familiar to us. And what I find is that my colleagues in academia keep saying, everything in the sky must be stones. I call that the stone age of science. <laughs> so the first three interstellar objects were the following. On January 8th, 2014, a meteor collided with Earth. It was the size of a watermelon. A meteor is an object that burns up in the atmosphere as a result of its friction with air. This one was anomalous. It was detected by US government satellites and was moving very fast. In fact, it came from behind the Earth as it orbits the sun. And even though it was trailing us, it moved already at 40 kilometers per second relative to Earth. And so altogether, we calculated outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second. That's a 1,000 times more than the speed limit on a highway. And it's faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So that was anomalous. And yet, in addition to that, it was able to maintain its integrity all the way down to the low atmosphere uh, where the stress on it was far greater than on any other meteor that NASA catalog, 272 of them over the past decade. So I thought, well, that's interesting. It could be a Voyager-like meteor. Imagine our own spacecraft colliding with another planet like Earth in the future and burning up in its atmosphere. It would, that meteor that would be visible there would be of unusual material strength because it's made of an artificial alloy and would also move at an unusual speed because it benefited from chemical propulsion. And then, almost four years later, a telescope in Hawaii named PanStars discovered a much bigger object that didn't collide with Earth. It was the size of a football field, was given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. And 
The amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. And the most likely shape of the object was that of a pancake, a flat object. Very unusual, unlike the rocks that we are familiar with. It also exhibited some non-gravitational push away from the sun without showing any cometary evaporation. There was no trail of dust or gas around it. And so I found that intriguing, unlike the rocks that we are familiar with. And my colleagues were saying, no, it's, it's a rock. It's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. A hydrogen iceberg, a nitrogen iceberg, a dust bunny. The version changed every few months, but it was always natural. And they always said, how dare you even bring up the possibility of an artificial origin? And by the way, that's exactly what a cave dweller would say when finding a cell phone. It's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Uh, on August 29th, 2019, finally, the third object showed up. It was discovered by an amateur astronomer, Gennady Borisov. And that one was a familiar comet. Didn't look any different than the comets that we saw many times in the solar system. So here is an interesting case. Out of three objects that came from interstellar space, the first two were unlike the rocks in the solar system. So could they be technological in origin? This is just a question. I'm just asking a question at the dinner table. <laughs> Why are the adults in the room dismissing it? Now, what is an interstellar object? Just imagine the sun here in red. Uh, the Earth is orbiting in a circle around the Sun at 30 kilometers per second. If the Earth was moving slightly faster at 42 kilometers per second, it would escape the gravitational pull of the Sun. It would run out of the solar system. So any object at that distance moving faster than 42 kilometers per second would be considered interstellar because it cannot be bound to the Sun. It can be part of the solar system. That's the definition of an interstellar object. That, that's how you find it. And Oumuamua was one. And here are two alternatives that were put out in the literature. One is a very unusual rock made of hydrogen, nitrogen, dust, you name it. Or maybe a very thin object that was pushed by reflecting sunlight, as I suggested. And that could be a surface layer of a bigger object or a broken piece, for example, of a Dyson sphere. Now, a uh, playwright in Los Angeles uh, was inspired by this work that I did on Oumuamua. He wrote a play that was presented at my home a couple of uh, months ago. And I just wanted to mention two statements from that play. The first relates to social media and to academia, I should add. Why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity? That really bothers me. Why are people more attracted to destructive interactions than to constructive ones? After all, we can all work together to figure it out. What's the big deal? And the second uh, item that I wanted to bring up is that I often tell young scientists, never pretend to be the adults in the room. And I say that to all of you, even though all of you are adults. <laughs> what I mean is metaphorically, you should maintain your childhood curiosity. Because that's the only way to discover new knowledge. And so what I'll describe is work done over the past two and a half years by the Galileo Project team. Uh, three of its members are in the audience, and I challenge you to find them <laughs> from this picture. And what we developed uh, is a, an observatory that is currently collecting data at Harvard University. Uh, and I'll show you a brief video that summarizes the various instruments. We are basically taking a video with audio, a movie of the sky, at all times, at one location. And we are planning to make copies of that observatory and put them 
in many other locations throughout the US to figure out whether there are objects that came from outside of this Earth around us. Welcome to an overview of the Galileo Project's development site, codenamed Pigeon Run. Our instrumentation suite consists of both wide field and narrow field sensors. Wide field sensors are used for target selection and tracking, while narrow field sensors gather higher resolution data on potentially anomalous objects. Our main instrument is DALEC, a hemispherical array of eight infrared cameras. Next to it is the ALCOR, a secondary high resolution optical all sky camera. Together, these instruments continuously monitor and track objects in the sky, analyzing them in real time for potential anomalous activity. This is AMOS, our acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system designed to detect and record acoustic signatures across the infrasonic, audible, and ultrasonic bands. AMOS also houses an ADS-B antenna for logging aircraft transponder data, allowing us to quickly separate known from unknown objects. Here we have Skywatch, a multi-static passive radar system designed to detect and track multiple objects simultaneously, measuring object positions and kinematics. And Pac-Man is an environmental monitoring system for measuring local weather conditions. Sensors include an anemometer, temperature and pressure sensors, a particle counter, and a flux gate magnetometer. Next up is Spectre, a radio spectrum analyzer with a wide band antenna for measuring radio and microwave emissions. Beacon is currently our only narrow field instrument. Beacon is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera capable of 40 times optical zoom. Our instruments collect a wide range of data, all of which is fed to our computing enclosure housed beneath the Dalek and Alcor instruments. Here, data is processed and analyzed in real time. Objects detected and tracked by the wide field instruments are localized in 3D space and analyzed for unusual characteristics. Selected targets are then sent to the Beacon PTZ for follow-up observation. Finally, data is recorded to disk and uploaded to the cloud via Starlink. These combined systems comprise the current version of the observatory class system, with many refinements, additions, and upgrades scheduled for near-term implementation at Pigeon Run. So we know how to do it. We are getting data as we speak, uh, for over a month now, we're analyzing it with machine learning our algorithms. Uh, we want it to be automated, so the human factor is not biasing any conclusion that we reach. And we are trying to figure out if in addition to birds, balloons, drones, airplanes, things that are familiar, there is something unfamiliar out there. And uh, obviously, we will um, use different data sets to figure out what these things are, uh, the scientific way, and report about it openly to the public. Our work is complementary to that of government. The day job of government is national security. Frankly, anything that says made in China is boring, as far as I'm concerned. I want to see if it says made in an exoplanet, far away. <laughs> And we are using satellite data, looking at objects from above, not just from below, using uh, Planet Lab's uh, satellite imagery. And we have um, a plan as to how to expand the current uh, system that we have operating. It costs about half a million dollars, and we are happy to make more copies uh, it just depends on the funding that we have. So if there's any potential donor in the audience that would like to have an observatory named after them, uh, please reach out to me. We know exactly what to do. We can build it in a place uh, of your liking. And we published uh, eight uh, papers by now. But what I want to focus on today is um, the interstellar meteor that I mentioned at the beginning, that was really the first interstellar object discovered uh, by humans. Uh, and uh, I decided to lead an expedition to the Pacific Ocean this summer between June 14th to 28th, two weeks, in the ocean, searching for the materials of this object. And I wrote 43 diary reports during that expedition. They were read by millions around the world, translated to Spanish, 
A lot of people thanked me for showing how science should be done. And so this object was discovered in 2014, but it took five years before I decided to look into it with my student, Amir Siraj. Um, and we were searching the catalog of meteors that NASA put publicly and looking for objects that are potentially interstellar, moving very fast. And we identified this one, we wrote a paper, submitted it for publication, and the reviewer said, no, this should not be published. We don't believe the US government. And so it took three years for me to reach out to colleagues within government through the White House, getting to the US uh, Space Command, uh, for the US Space Command to issue a formal letter to NASA uh, stating that they looked into the data and can confirm at the 99.999% confidence that indeed this object came from interstellar space. At which point, our paper was accepted for publication and the government also released the light curve of the fireball that was generated. This event produced about a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. And uh, based on the data, we concluded that the object was at least the size of a watermelon. It could have been bigger than that. The three flares that were seen from this fireball were separated by a tenth of a second. And uh, from the fact that they occurred um, within 20 kilometers above the ocean surface, we were able to tell that the material strength of this object was tougher than iron. It was tougher than all space rocks that NASA cataloged be before. And at that point, I decided to lead an expedition because I'm a theoretical physicist, but nobody else would do it unless <laughs> I, I bring together the, the team, and uh, so um, we used the error box of the Department of Defense, which was seven miles on a side, and we wanted to localize the meteor path better, and we found some public data from a seismometer on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. And uh, just as in the case of a thunder, where, where you hear the sound after you see the light from the lightning, uh, we detected a sound signal on this seismometer data, and from the time delay, we could tell the distance of the explosion knowing the speed of sound. And that led us to the red strip that you see within the DOD error box. So we rented the ship that was fittingly called Silver Star uh, from Australia, and I'll show you some photographs from that expedition. In my sister, thinking I am where you are, drifting in my sister, thinking I am on where you are, drifting in my sister. Thinking I am one where you are drifting in my silver star. Thinking I am one where you are. So here is the deck of the ship with uh, the 28 people that uh, came on board some of the best engineers and navigators in the world. I was very pleased that they chose to join us. And what you see behind the team is an A-frame that was directing a cable connected to the ship to a sled that we put down on the ocean floor with magnets on both sides to collect particles that were melted off the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it generated as a result of its friction. And so we were looking for millimeter-sized particles, the size of a grain of sand, at a mile deep ocean across a region of seven miles. That sounds hopeless, 
And indeed, many people said, why waste the time? But very often in life, it's important to be an optimist because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So here are some more images. What you see in the middle and the right-hand side uh, are images uh, of us pulling the sled out of the water. Um, the cable was about three miles long, so it took about an hour to bring the sled up. And then we would put it flat on the deck and scrape the magnets for all the magnetic particles that we found. What you see on the bottom left and middle is me jogging at sunrise, as I do on land. I kept this routine on the ship, and we had a filming crew there, one out of 50 that wanted to join us. Uh, and they asked me if they can film me jogging in the morning, so they asked me, could you please jog a little more? And it ended up being <laughs> nine miles. <laughs> uh, and I realized that my workout uh, app is actually not measuring my speed, it measures the speed of the ship. <laughs> Just keep that in mind if you are ever <laughs> jogging on a ship. Um, it's GPS. Uh, and at the end of my run, uh, the director of this uh, documentary asked me, Avi, it looks like you're running. Are you running away from something or towards something? And I replied, both. I'm running away from some of my colleagues who have very strong opinions without seeking evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. So here are some more photos. You can see the sled. Um, uh, and we use the vacuum cleaner sometimes to clean it up from all the magnetic particles. And then we would dry up uh, whatever was in the vacuum cleaner. Uh, and we would put those particles under a microscope that we had on the ship. Uh, but in the first six days, all we found was volcanic ash, black powder, tiny particles from Earth. And I was frustrated. Uh, uh, and then uh, at, at that point, we decided to filter the material and uh, let the volcanic ash go um, using a mesh size of about a quarter of a millimeter. And the bigger particles were put under a microscope. And lo and behold, we found a molten droplet from a meteor. And I knew it. I, I was thrilled. I, I hugged the person who saw it first on the microscope because I knew that uh, when I find an ant in the kitchen, I get alarmed. There must be many more ants out there. And uh, indeed, we found 50 of those ferals on the ship. So let me show you a brief uh, video of um, how the image from down below, how the sled was going over the ocean floor. It, it was basically like mowing the lawn, except <laughs> there was no lawn down there at uh, a mile deep. Uh, there was, uh, we saw some shrimp, um, but it was mostly muck. Uh, and the, the magnets on the sled were collecting uh, magnetic particles that we brought up. Uh, and every now and then we would uh, encounter a rock that uh, uh, would slow us down a bit. Uh, the biggest challenge was to keep the sled on the ocean floor because it was kiting uh, as a result of the tension in the cable. It was floating above the surface. So that required some expertise. Here you see a rock. Uh, obviously, we couldn't collect this one. But we are hoping to go back and look for bigger pieces of the original meteor, because that could tell us the difference between a rock, a natural object, and an artificial gadget. And I asked my students at class, if we find a gadget and it has buttons on it, should we press a button? <laughs> and half of them said, please don't. It will affect all of us. <laughs> And the other half said, please do. We would like to know if it's uh, GPT-100. Maybe it will give us some interesting insight. Uh, and then a student uh, raised his hand and said, well, Professor Loeb, uh, given the split vote, what would you actually do? And I said, I will bring it to a laboratory and examine it before engaging with it. You shouldn't worry about it. And actually, I promised uh, Paula Antonelli, uh, the curator of the Museum of Modern Art, just a, a week ago, I attended a dinner with, uh, hosted by Bill Ackman and, and, and Neri Oxman. And 
Um, there was General Patreas there in, the, in that uh, dinner, and he was talking about the geopolitical future awaiting us uh, after the Israel-Hamas war. And uh, his forecast was not very hopeful. But uh, <laughs> uh, Paula Antonelli summarized her vision with three words. She said, love the aliens. And what she meant is that we should love each other, especially when we are different. Frankly, I am infatuated by others that might be smarter than I am, because I can learn from them. So I promised Paula that I will bring, if we find anything in the next expedition, I'll bring it for exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, because it would represent modernity for us, even though it may be ancient history for the senders. At any event, we went 26 times across this uh, error box and in some control regions to figure out the background. And uh, here on the left, you can see the whiteboard where we wrote the number 50. We thought, that's amazing. We found 50 spherules, uh, molten droplets. But uh, we shipped the entirety of the materials uh, um, with FedEx to my home. But um, here you see an image from the microscope that demonstrates how distinct are these spheros. They look like metallic marbles uh, relative to the background sand, and we pick them with tweezers. And when I posted these images on uh, Medium, uh, my daughter saw them and said, uh, could you please uh, thread one of them uh, on a necklace for me? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, they are millimeter in size and they're made mostly of iron. It's not practical. She was very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so we delivered those babies. Uh, what you see is the delivery room, which uh, looks like a white container, white box. Uh, and we put the babies, uh, instead of in their beds, we put them in vials. And we marked it, we labeled those vials, uh, 50 spherules, shipped them to my home. And you can see on the right-hand side the uh, suitcase that they were in. And when I received it and opened it, I realized, well, FedEx took a few extra days to deliver it, but it's nothing compared to the billions of years that it took the material to arrive here. So it's not a big delay. And what you see on the left is, uh, the team examining the sled on a rainy night. The funder is actually to my right in a black uh, raincoat, uh, Charles Hoskinson. And so I brought the materials to my colleague at Harvard, Stein Jacobson, who has a, one of the best mass spectrometers in the world. You see it in front of us. Uh, and uh, on the other side of me in this photo, you can see my summer intern, Sophie Bergstrom, who decided to shadow me this summer and uh, write about how I do my science because she wants to become a science journalist. But at some point she said, uh, could I help you with the science? And I said, sure, and I gave her a pair of tweezers and the microscope. She went through the materials again and found 600 spherules. So I gave her the honorary title, the Spheral Hunter. <laughs> And uh, we have many more now. So altogether, nearly 800 spherules, out of which we analyzed only 57 publicly. And we are currently, these days, analyze the, um, we are analyzing 93% of the sample that we have. So most of it is not yet uh, analyzed. But when we made a map of the distribution of spherules, uh, this is a map of the yield of spherules per amount of mass that was retrieved. And this map was uh, produced by Laura Domini, who is in the audience here, uh, a member of the Galileo Project. Uh, what we found is that near the meteor path, which is delineated in orange, um, I mean, the left side is the zoomed out map, and the right side is the zoomed in map of the meteor path. Uh, what we found is that there are enhancements in the yield in, in these yellow regions close to the meteor path relative to the background. 
And so it means that we were in the right spot. And uh, on the first day, as we came back from the expedition, we passed through San Francisco Airport, went to Berkeley, and used a scanning electron microscope to look at the inside of some of the spherules. And what we found is amazing. There are spheres inside spheres, just like Russian dolls. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, the small spheres solidified first, and then they were engulfed with molten iron that glued them together. Here is a sphere that looks like a soccer ball, and another one that looks like a merger of three spheres. And uh, this one was particularly interesting because it was in a yellow region. It, it was one of the biggest that we had, 1.3 millimeters in diameter. So we decided to analyze it first. And what we found is that the iron isotopes have a ratio that is very different from rocks on Earth, or Mars, or the Moon. But most importantly, we looked at the concentration of elements in the periodic table, starting from lithium on the left, going to uranium on the right. And we normalized the abundances relative to the standard solar composition. So that's the composition of the stuff that made the solar system. Uh, that's uh, marked by one on this plot. And what we found is that elements like beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium have a higher abundance by factors of hundreds to a thousand relative to the standard solar composition. And it's not just these three elements. You can see many in between. Uh, and uh, we decided, since this abundance pattern was never seen, never reported in the literature, the scientific literature, we had to give it a new name, which we um, decided would be Belau, for beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium. That's a new type of spheros never seen before. And here are five of them that have this Belau composition. And here we plot the elements based on their volatility, meaning that elements on the right can be easily lost as a result of evaporation during an explosion, during an airburst. And indeed, they are missing. Those elements have a lower abundance uh, than expected. And so that demonstrates that the Belau spherules were associated with an explosion, a meteor. Now, in recent days, this week, you must have heard those uh, bloggers and scientists, astronomers, or people that call themselves <laughs> astrophysicists, they are not real scientists, um, who say that what we found is coal ash. And that's a bit strange. I was asked by a reporter this morning, I said, look, we were using a magnetic sled with magnets, and ash has very little iron. So, you know, if you are smart, you choose the battles that you fight, that you are willing to die on. But apparently, these people were willing to die on a, on a battle that makes no sense whatsoever. I just don't understand why they are doing it. And in fact, we, you can see here a plot that shows at one corner the iron abundance, at another the silicon, at the third one magnesium, and the Belau spherules are located very far away from fly ash, which is in the upper corner. So no way that we could have confused fly ash with the Belau spherules. And, you know, it's really strange that there, is, there are those people who jump up and down, and I'm not talking about one or two, I'm talking about a lot of people cheering up to what they said, uh, saying the problem is solved, this expedition found our own coal. Um, it's, to me, very sad to see that because it shows how disinformation can propagate even on matters of science. And one of these bloggers, when I said, 
that he calls himself an astrophysicist, but he never, he didn't publish a single scientific paper over the past decade. So how dare he talk about it? I mean, as if he is a practicing scientist, uh, he's a pretender. How can he represent the way science is done? How can he tell practicing scientists what to do? It's like commentators telling soccer players how to pass the ball. Um, and he saw this and put it on his Twitter handle. The title, a blogger who did not publish for a decade. So he is proud of his incompetence. And my point is really simple. My point is simple. Those who are proud of their incompetence will not terrorize real scientists. I don't give a damn about what he says. It's all about paying attention to the data. So then the question is, where did this Belau composition originate from? And I have two alternative scenarios. One is a natural explanation, and uh, one can explain it imagining a planet outside the solar system, because this was not found on Earth, Mars, the moon, asteroids. So imagine an exoplanet that had a magma ocean and an iron core some elements would sink to the center of the planet and others will be left behind in the crust. Those are the elements that we see enhanced. So if there is a planet, an exoplanet, that was a magma ocean and was ripped apart, then perhaps this meteor came from it. And in fact, if you take the Earth, we all know about the tide that the moon raises in the ocean. So just imagine replacing the moon with the sun. Even if you put the Earth next to the sun, it will not be disrupted by the tidal force of the sun because the density of the sun is less than the density of rock. But if you consider the most abundant type of stars, dwarf stars, the nearest one is Proxima Centauri, the nearest star, 12% of the mass of the sun, about a tenth of the radius of the sun. Such stars are 100 times denser than rock. So if you take a planet like the Earth and bring it close to such a star, it would get spaghettified, elongated into a stream of rocks, half of which will be ejected to interstellar space at a speed that we calculated is similar to this meteor. So here is a natu possible natural origin. But of course, it's also possible that it was artificial in origin. And I want to emphasize that this expedition was risky. It was not obvious that we'll get funded at one and a half million dollars. Uh, I might not have been successful at recruiting qualified engineers and navigators for this task. Our machinery might not have accomplished the task, perhaps that the sled would not sit on the ocean floor, so we would never collect anything. And this meteor might have not had enough mass to provide us with enough spherols for us to find. And moreover, my colleague at Harvard might have told me that he's too busy, uh, and he cannot help me, and then we would never find the Belau composition. So what I'm trying to say is to in order to find new knowledge, we really need to take risks. And our goal in the next expedition is potentially to visit that site again and look for bigger pieces. And here I am uh, standing next to Art Wright, the party chief of this uh, expedition, uh, who was the commander of a destroyer during the Vietnam War. He's 85 years old. I really liked him because he didn't say much, but everything he said was right. And we were looking at the sunset on the last day and planning the next expedition. So in summary, I just wanted to mention the guiding principles that I developed as a result of this experience. First of all, most important is to follow evidence by collecting data with state-of-the-art instruments that are fully under control and are well calibrated. In other words, instruments that you understand. 
That's the way science is done, not by polling how many people like you on Twitter or X. And I'm, I'm sure that Elon Musk is not putting such a poll because I'm not sure how he will <laughs> be ranked. Um, and then the principle that FIFA, the Football Association, advocates. Listen to eyewitnesses. That's perfectly fine. You know, if a player comes along and says, I thought that the ball really went past the, the goal, you know, uh, you can listen to that. And you, what, but what you do to decide what really happened is to go to the cameras and check. That's what FIFA does. They don't decide based on what the players tell them or the audience tells them. Because we all know that when there is a car accident, different people give very different reports about what happened. So science is done by instruments to avoid a bias, a potential um, agenda that a human may have. And then another principle from sports that is advocated by basketball coaches Keep your eyes on the ball, not on the audience. I'm looking at the audience, but <laughs> I should. Um, and what I mean by that is that I have no footprint on social media. I don't care how many likes I get on Twitter or X. It's really irrelevant. Because if you listen to too many people, you basically reduce yourself to the lowest common denominator. And another important phenomenon that I um, obviously witnessed is those pretenders who pretend to protect science. They say that they are pro-science, but they ignore facts that disagree with their models. And so, for example, two astronomers on the day that I came back from the expedition published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal saying that the government measured the speed incorrectly. It was three times smaller. This object was actually a stone from the solar system. They did it at the time that I was bringing back the materials. Why wouldn't they just wait? Another important uh, principle, don't mud wrestle because those who call you names, you know, should be ignored. If you engage with them, it will get you dirty. So just ignore it. And rise instead to the greatest heights of scientific practice where the oxygen level is too low for these critics. My hope is that they will drop off, just like crows that drop off the back of an eagle and stop pecking at its neck. I should say they haven't stopped yet. I'm doing my best to get rid of them. And as I mentioned before, it's important to be an optimist because life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And without searching, you will never find anything. Thank you.